Good to be with you today. Good to be with you today. Next Sunday is going to be a time a um, little bit different. We try to do this uh, once, twice a year, Q&A time. Now, it, it sounds maybe academic, sounds cerebral, it sounds disconnected from our hearts, but my philosophy as a pastor is this. If we can't take some of the difficult things that we wrestle with when it comes to faith or belief or even we live in and, and don't emotionally, meaning how does this relate to our everyday lives, then I haven't done my job as a pastor. Because even the most cerebral of topics, creation and evolution, for example, there's a devotional aspect to it. And so I'm going to encourage you guys, write down your questions. Ryan and I are going to be up here having kind of a conversational format. And I want you to understand that there is no question beyond the reach of our God to make it connect to something valuable, significant, purposeful for our lives. So we're going to do that next Sunday. So I'm looking forward to that, you guys. So fill out your communication card, write down a question. Uh, if you want to just text it to me or Ryan, our numbers are in the, um, in the program and the announcement sheet. So uh, mine's easy to remember. It's 1976 pastor. So uh, not really. So what's up? We, we'll deal with that next week. That might take the whole service. I don't know. We'll, we'll have to un, unpack that. So my question is, can, uh, can Jesus love smart aleck pastoral interns? I mean, that's why they, hey, they persecuted Jesus too. They persecuted Jesus too. All right. So Luke 16 is where we're going to be. Who likes Goodwill? Anyone like Goodwill out there? All right. So uh, my daughter must be the biggest Goodwill junkie in the, in the world. So but dad, I bought this for a dollar. Yeah, but when you go every day uh, and you buy, you know, it, it all adds up. But so in Texas, a woman calls the Goodwill frantically. I just donated a box to close and in the box is a jacket and in the pocket of that jacket is $5,000. Just this past week. So feverishly, the employees looked and lo three weeks it took and they found the jacket with the money in it and the employee that found it guess what they got a nice little tip but can you imagine five thousand dollars in a jacket you're 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 calling in sick to work to find that money right you you're you're moving mountains to 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 find this money this is not an insignificant amount of money and so for three weeks it was a uh it was a focused diligent search to find the money and when it comes to money, our lives are like this. We, we feverishly work. We feverishly make an income. We feverishly spend money. And sometimes it's not necessarily uh, a healthy, healthy type thing. Work is a good thing. Money can be used for good things. But I think sometimes we don't have an un, uh, a healthy understanding of money and what we're called to do. Um, isn't it interesting, Thanksgiving which is whose favorite holiday? Who likes Thanksgiving out there? We like Thanksgiving. Why? Because it's not about the commercialism of, of the holiday. You know, it's, it's time for family and food. And our Thanksgiving was a bummer this past year because we got COVID and it was just our family of five. And when you've already looked at each other for, for nine months, you just don't want to continue to do this, right? Um, so Thanksgiving, but here's the thing. Quickly, our, our time of gratitude and thanksgiving and even maybe momentary contentment, contentment is gone because right after thanksgiving is Black Friday, right? It's like immediately on the heels to pounce on us to show us we need that 4,800 square foot LED TV for 400 bucks at Walmart and I'm willing to kill people to get it. You know, like this is how, so Black Friday and then there's Small Business Saturday, which happens the next day. And then you know what gets the, the leftovers is Giving Tuesday. Isn't that funny? The sequence, think about this. Here's the sequence of events for, for five days. Thanksgiving, Black Friday, Small Business Saturday. No, no, Cyber Monday. And then Giving Tuesday. Like you have anything left. And that's the way we approach finances. It's like, God, I spent all my money on that big screen TV and killed two people. I have nothing left to show you that I love you. And that's how we approach finances. God gets the leftovers if there's any. And I'm going to tell you right now, statistically, most people live off 118% of their income. You know what that means? It means you're spending more than you're making. 
Look at Congress. They're doing it right now. Uh, this, is, this is the reality of it. Arizona. You know where we rank on the most generous state index? 46. 46. We are, we are the 46th most generous state in the country. And the fact that we're being beat out by places like New Hampshire, I can't stand that. Oregon, how dare they? Here's the thing, you guys. God wants us to be generous people. But there's no place for generosity if we don't have an understanding of what God says about money. This is one of my favorite topics. I was just talking to a pastor this past week, and they're like, I dread talking about finances. And I'm like, you're kidding me. It's one of my favorite topics. And you want to know why? Because it's about what God wants for you rather than what God wants from you. Please remember this. As long as I have pastored, church, pastored churches, which has been a long time, been involved in ministry, I have never, and I can honestly say this, 30 plus years of ministry, I've never asked anyone for money. Never. But I have talked about the importance of worshiping God with our finances. But I've never asked, we've never passed a plate. Two churches my wife and I have been a part of, we've never passed a plate. There's always been that little mailbox right there by the door that I always encourage people, just put it right in front of the door. That way people can't avoid it. But we've always just trust like God to work through the, I mean, look, you guys, look at our finances. You guys are, are, are killing it when it comes to generosity. I don't have to stand up here and plead or beg. I don't have to have a big thermometer picture and be like, look, we're almost there, you guys. You know, you know why we're, we're not desperate when it comes to understanding, honoring God with our wealth is because our God is the God who owns it all. And if we just trust him, he'll provide. He'll provide, and I truly believe that. Never, ever have asked anyone for money. But people have mo been moved to, to give. And I praise God for those people. And, the, and, and we come to this topic of generosity. Why? Because this is important for every single one of us. Because it's less about what you have and more about what you do with what you have. Because if you continue in the same patterns, you're going to continue to be joyless. You're going to continue to be con lacking contentment. You're going to be continually like going, can't wait for Cyber Monday and Black Friday and Small Business Saturday. And all. You, there's greater things to live for. You become a generous, I believe generosity is the new evangelism. You've heard me say that before. Now, I, I will tell you, I have said something in the past that it's not contradictory, but I've also said that hospitality is the new evangelism. I'm going to say that maybe the two aren't diametrically opposed to one another. Hospitality and generosity, the new evangelism. This is not what God wants from you. Remember, this is what God wants for you. Jesus spoke on money more than any other topic. The Bible addresses money in 2,500 plus verses. This is a topic that is near and dear to the heart of God. Why? Because he needs your money? No. He wants your hearts. This is what God's after. See, the amount is irrelevant. The motivation and the attitude and the behaviors, that's what's important. And so this morning we turn to Luke 16, probably one of the most difficult parables Jesus ever told. Because on the surface, it sounds like he's commending dishonesty. On the surface, it sounds like, what is Jesus applauding here? And I love the fact that Jesus continues to mess with our heads. Uh, I, I will follow a God who continues to turn things over on their heads and be like, oh, I thought up was down, and now you're saying that down is up. Okay, we'll, we'll go with this. See, he teaches in a parable. Parables are simple stories for people like me who, who need things dumbed down a bit that teach one main point. A parable is not meant to be taken apart and, and to, to draw out 20 different observations. A parable teaches one point. And the one point behind this parable today is this, generosity. The parable of the dishonest manager is ultimately a story about generosity. Wisdom and how we use wealth in this world so that the joy in the next world is maximized. How will you use worldly resources? How will you use secular money 
as a means of maximizing joy in the next life. The key is generosity. And we're going to, I've taught, I went back in my notes, I've taught on this parable several times. And I've reworked a totally new message. The end result's the same, but it's a new message. Because I never ever go back and just pull this old, you know, I got this sugar stick message I gave 10 years ago, I'll just throw it on there and no, 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 this is a brand new message because as we approach the word, it's the same goal, but you, you see different things or you, you identify different things. And, and so today is a radical call to biblical stewardship in this age of worldly wealth. No matter where you may think you are when it comes to your wealth compared to the person next to you, your neighbor, if you live in the United States of America, you are among the world's wealthiest 1%. And it doesn't matter how much you move the needle when it comes to tens of thousands of dollars you may earn, you are among the world's wealthiest people. But what we do with this is incredibly important. And that's why Jesus teaches on stewardship. And, and I want us to, to understand there's three ways to approach money or, or sex or any topic we want to talk about, which sex would be fun, but not today. Um, we could either run from the topic we can either give in to it or we can consecrate it. See, if you run from the topic of money, basically you're giving into this theology of poverty and it's this idea that, you know what, um, I can gain righteousness by just giving up, becoming like a monk or a nun, just giving up all this, all this stuff. We're not going to run from this topic and embrace a theology of, of poverty, nor are we going to give into it, meaning embrace wealth and, and this theology of prosperity as if, you know, God's love for me is indicated by the car I drive and the coats I wear and the shoes I, 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 I have on my feet. You know, none of that. We're going to take this topic of worldly wealth and consecrate it. You know what that means? We're going to say, we're going to leverage this topic so that Christ will be magnified. How can we use worldly wealth and use it in such a way that Christ is magnified? We're going to see that in the parable today. Turn to Luke 16, verse 1. Luke 16, verse 1. So, Jesus tells this parable, and you remember, we just got done talking about the prodigal Son and son and dad. Remember, everyone's a prodigal. Everyone's wasteful. Some are wasteful in a bad way. Some are wasteful in a good way. Aren't you glad there's a prodigal God who wastes resources on you? Now there's a prodigal manager. See, the prodigal theme continues. Luke 16, check this out, verse 1. He was also saying to the disciples, so the audience is the disciples, but the Pharisees, the religious leaders, are still listening in. There's a certain rich man who had a steward, a manager, and this manager was reported to him as squandering, being a prodigal with his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship so that you, you'll no longer be my steward. And the steward said to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking the stewardship away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I shall do so that when I am removed from this position as steward, they will receive me into their homes." So he summoned each one of the master's debtors and he began saying to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measure, measures of oil. And he said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, write 50, we're good. He says to another, how much do you owe my master? He says, a hundred measures of wheat. He says, take your bill, write 80, we're good. And the master praised the unrighteous steward because he had acted shrewdly for the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by means of the mammon of unrighteousness, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much, and he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous in much. If therefore you have not been faithful, in the use of unrighteous mammon, who will entrust the true riches to you? And if you have been, not been faithful in the use of what was another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve or, or worship God and money. So the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, wow, were listening to him, and all these things, and they're scoffing at him. 
And he says to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts. That which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since then, the gospel of the kingdom is preached, and everyone is forcing his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one stroke of the letter of the law to fail. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries one who is divorced from a husband commits adultery. What an interesting way to end a parable about money. Let's be honest. Money, marriage, sometimes they are um, unloving, ungracious bedfellows. Number one cause of marriage disillusion oftentimes is money. Right? We'll talk about that end part here in a, in a bit. Three main points points actually four main points we're going crazy today uh four main points from this text that i think will encourage us number one we are to use worldly wealth not worldly wealthy sorry for the typo cross out that extra y i won't charge you extra for that worldly wealth to demonstrate wisdom this is this is the main point and we're going to draw out a couple other points that are important but the wisdom piece is so important meaning we've got to be smarter you guys Here's Jesus. Jesus is saying there's this dude who doesn't even love God, who lacks integrity, who uses money in a worldly way better than we, who are believers in God, use our money in a otherworldly way. He's saying the people of this world are smarter than us. And doggone it, that shouldn't be the case. You who say you have a relationship with the Almighty ought to be doing things not only differently, but better. And how people of this world use their resources in ways that are better than those of us who have an eye toward eternity and hope in Christ. Can I get an amen from somebody? We ought to be wise, you guys. So here's this wealthy manager. Let's just, he had two titles. He was COO and CFO. This guy not only was the manager, but he was also the financial steward of the, the, the estate of this incredibly wealthy person. And we find out that he is just wasteful. What does it mean to, to be a prodigal manager? What does it mean to, to be someone who they themselves are not rich, but they're working for an incredibly rich person? It means this guy went out and he padded his expense accounts. He had lavish meals. He stayed at the nicest hotels. He took a limo everywhere he went. He had front row season tickets at the Jerusalem Jumpers ba- basketball games. I mean, here's this guy. This guy was living life high on the hog, but he was a Jew, so life high on the goat. We'll just call it that. This guy lived la vida loca. He was it, right? And, and it seems like Jesus is, is saying, be like that guy who lived for himself, which again sounds so different than what Jesus has taught us up to this point. But notice, first point is that you can learn from unrighteousness. You can learn from unrighteous people. You can learn from unrighteous settings. I, there's a, a counselor by the name of Larry Crabb. I really like Larry Crabb's stuff. I think I just heard he died a couple months ago. Larry Crabb contributed a lot to the the world of Christian counseling. He said when Israel left Egypt, when they were delivered, led by Moses, they they borrowed things from that secular culture. And they call that borrowing from the Egyptians. Ladies and gentlemen, the world, there's some wisdom in this world that you can learn from people who don't love God. You can learn from situations that aren't necessarily godly. You can learn, learn from situations that aren't necessarily Christian. So we can borrow from the Egyptians and we can learn from unrighteousness. See, here's what we know about this this manager. He was a loser. (laughs) Verses 1 and 2 tell us that. But he was kind of an intelligent loser. Verses 3 and 4 tell us this, right? And there are three things that I believe Jesus wants us to copy from this unrighteous manager. Number one, you're to copy his urgency. You're to copy his urgency. This guy literally had hours left because when the 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 owner called in he didn't necessarily bring all the books with him he's like hey what are you doing right now meet me over at sozo coffee we got we got we had to have a little chat so they meet up and he says you've been wasteful you're done go get the books the guy leaves there and goes okay what do i do what do i do what do i do 
he gets all the books and he starts setting appointments with all the people that owe his boss money. The word on the street hasn't spread yet that this guy's out of a job. So he says, let's settle up. How much you owe? You owe 100? Okay, make it 50. You owe 100? Make it 80. And he starts wheeling and dealing. He realizes he only has hours left. He has to act quickly. Ladies and gentlemen, your season of strength, your season of opportunity, your season of wealth is fleeting. You're not here forever. You have a, you are a, the Bible says you are a vapor. <laughs> How urgent are you in laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven rather than continuing to lay up for yourselves treasures on earth? Copy this man's urgency because one day you will leave this world and you ain't taking anything with you Spend it while you got it, and hopefully you're doing it in a God-honoring way. Because if you don't choose to do it, someone else will choose to do it for you. You may not like how the other person spends your money once you leave this world, but guess what? If you don't do it now and have a say in it, it's going to be done with, without your, 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 your counsel and advice. Number two, copy this man's ingenuity. You got to admit, this guy was creative. You gotta admit, this guy goes, I, I'm gonna end up with nothing. How do I take nothing and make it something? Talk about ingenuity. So when Lori and I were first dating and I realized that she was the person I wanted to spend the, the rest of my life with, uh, we were both 20 years old, 21 years old. And um, the summer I proposed to her, I was a starving college student, right? I was on the seven-year plan at Arizona State University. Anyone else do the seven-year plan? Okay. We have, I have no money. She has no money. We're just a bunch of stupid kids in love, right? Um, and I thought, how do I take what little I have and get creative with it and secure her as my wife for the rest, for the rest of my life? So I, I got my brother and a couple of friends to do this most romantic night, the night I knew I was going to propose to her. I said, I'm going to be taking you to a restaurant that no one's ever been to before. I said, we're going to have dessert in a location no one has ever had dessert at. So she's like, <laughs> little did she know, I had my friends, my brother and my friends set up a candlelight table in this business park in this grassy area where there's this river and this bridge. And it was, it's like Narnia. <laughs> and I think there was a lion. I, I think I heard a lion. <laughs> but there we were. And I, and I think we had Chinese food from this place called Hunan's Chinese Restaurant on Camelback and 16th Street. And at the time, they had this thing called Hunan's Back Door. Literally, you walk behind the building where the trash is, you knock on the door, there's a handwritten menu, and the guy right there just makes you like this biggest amount of food for like five bucks. Here's the thing. My wife wasn't won over by the elegant dinner we had that night she's going this guy's creative this guy's taking little and he's making much we went from that candlelight dinner drove up uh lincoln and 32nd street went up to this this mountain there's a giant water tank on this mountain overlooking the city you climb up this ladder and i had my friend set up a a, a blanket with ben and jerry's ice cream and candles what does a pint of Ben and Jerry's cost 30 years ago? A couple bucks. And there we were eating dessert together on top of a water tank overlooking Phoenix. So at this point, I'm $15 in to this, 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 this <laughs> dinner. The night I'm going to propose to my wife, I'm 15 bucks in. And we finish up by going to Scottsdale Center for the Arts where we had our first date. We had our first kiss. And my friends had put the ring behind a bench that they were across the lake watching to make sure no one else sat there. <laughs> no one else decided to reach behind. I mean, this is at night, right? But who's, who's walking around and looking behind? Maybe tip, pro tip number one. When you're at a park, look behind benches. You never know what's hiding there. And I got down on my knee and I asked her to marry me. I did that, why? I, I took risk. 
I, I pushed the envelope. I, I, I was thought I, I was being, cl- and I took little and I made much of it because I wanted to secure her love forever. You guys, you, you need to do things that are a little bit crazy, a little bit different. You need to do things that maybe someone else wouldn't have thought of the idea. But what do you have to lose? By getting creative and taking risks and doing crazy things, what do you have to lose? When you don't have much, and you, maybe you think you don't have much, or maybe you have a lot, do crazy things with it. Do crazy things with it. This guy went out, and he eliminated <laughs> all this debt. So he became a friend, right? C- number three, copy his fourth foresight. Copy his foresight. He thought ahead. Most of us don't think about tomorrow. We're, we're, we're not... You, you need to plan, you need to prepare, right? Yes, there's a thing that says, be concerned about today, don't worry about tomorrow. We believe that, but that doesn't mean we don't prepare for the future, and especially when there's uncertain endings that are gonna come to all of us. You don't know how you're gonna die, you don't know when you're gonna die, but here's the thing, you know you're gonna die. And you're not taking anything with you. So this guy had incredible foresight, right? Where he said, I will give favors because one day I'm gonna get a favor. This is how you, this is called the code of reciprocity. The code of reciprocity, meaning I'm going to do something for you because later I'm going to need a favor from you. So he went to the guy with the oil and he said, I'm going to eliminate your debt. Guess how much he eliminated? About three years worth of wages. That guy's like, I got a deal. We, when uh, I had a surgery years ago and I've had weird surgery. Nothing normal happens to Scott Morgan, right? I get lipomas on my shoulder. I get benign growths of capillaries on my brain. I get weird stuff that, that happened. But I remember, here we were again. I think this was before kids, or we, our kids were really little, and the hospital sent us the bill, and we're just like, oh, crap. How are we going to pay this? So we went and met with the hospital uh, administrator, and basically they said, if you pay half of it today in cash, we'll eliminate the rest. Guess what we did? We paid it. Get the pennies. We brought all our pennies. No, we didn't do that. We paid it, right? Because when, you're, when you get a 50% reduction, you act. You act. And so this guy, three years wages, he saved. The wheat guy, he saved eight years wages. So this guy goes around to all the master's creditors, and he revises their bill so that they end up in his debt. This is called the code of reciprocity. Let me just tell you right now, this is not a code believers in Christ should embrace. Okay? This is called ledger-keeping relationships. We do not keep ledgers with one another. Anyone keep a ledger with... No, let's... Anyone keep a ledger with you? <laughs> anyone, anyone, you know, pulling out that like, well, you need to help me because remember two weeks ago I helped you? It's time to pay up. Relationships do not thrive in ledger environments. And you're sitting there going, oh, I'm not a ledger keeper. Yeah, if, if, if there's any tinge of saying, hey, honey, can I buy this for this person? Because last week they gave me a gift. You know what a gift is? A gift is a one-sided transaction that says, I value you, here's a gift. It's not a bargaining moment. It's not a business transaction where it's like, oh, they gave me this. I got to do something for them. That, that's the moment you're sucking life out of relationship. I know some of you are like, but I've got the, the uh, love language of gift giving. I don't care what you got. Here's the thing. You do not keep track of what people have done for you, and you don't keep track of what you do for people. It's a done deal. Jesus says, do not let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. You know why he says that? Be forgetful. Instead of remembering debts, just forget them. And I'm going to do a little Dave Ramsey moment for us. Don't, get, don't loan people money and stuff. Gift it. Gift it. I've seen too many relationships sabotage. Because now you always, now there's this weird thing in the relationship that says, I gave that guy a thousand bucks. And you're like, until he pays up, that's always going to be right there. Guess what? It's, it's a gift. It's not a loan. It's a gift. Can I get an amen from somebody? So copy his urgency, copy his ingenuity, copy his foresight, because this guy was, was leveraging something for his, for his future. Now, we ought to have foresight, and this is where the second point in this, so we can learn from unrighteousness, but how do we now live in righteousness? How do we 
become not only people of ingenuity, but also people of integrity. This is where we live in righteousness. See, as a believer, there comes a shift as you follow Jesus where life becomes less enjoyment and more investment. There, I'm not saying we don't enjoy life, but what we see is that our time, treasures, and talents ought to be something that are invested. And so Jesus is keen in on this investment point. This is why 1 Timothy, Paul says in, in, in chapter 6, as for the rich present age, charge them not to be prideful or haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, which is true, but set your hope on God, foresight, right, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So there's the enjoyment piece. They are to do good. Here's the investment, right? To be rich in good works, to be generous, to be ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. So Paul says there is something about eternal riches that we can use earthly resources to aim for this. So how do we live in righteousness? Two things. Number one, you're going to use earthly resources to benefit God's purposes. And you're going to use earthly resources to bless God's people. So two things. So Scott, what do I do with what's entrusted to me? Now, Again, notice the word I just used, entrusted. You own nothing. Here's the eureka moment of the morning. You're not an owner. You're a manager. You're a manager. Some of you are like, no, I'm an owner. I went to school. I got an education. I got a job. Who gave you the brain to get that education? Who allowed your body to function while you slept at night with, with you unaware of anything going on? With Who kept your life sustained? Nothing you have isn't first given by God for you to enjoy him and to bless others. See, ladies and gentlemen, the problem with us is that we have owner mentalities. What God wants us to do is change to manager mentality. And the one thing God doesn't want us to do is squander his resources. This is why we are to do two things. We are to benefit God's purposes and bless God's people. See, we are to leverage what God has given to us. And I'm not saying don't provide for your family because we know Timothy says, right, if, if you don't provide for your family, you're worse than an unbeliever. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that when God increases your standard of living, you ought to increase your standard of giving. And that what God has given to you, you need to leverage for eternally significant things. This is foresight. This is urgency. This is ingenuity, right? The Christian who manages this world's wealth to do God's work in God's way will have, notice what it says in verses 8 and 9, you'll have God as a friend, heaven as a home, and eternity filled with people that are grateful for you. Think about this. What a reward to know that secular wealth that I was able to use for God and for others is now there's a reward that says, I now have God as a friend, heaven as a home, and people who are rejoicing over the fact that I was generous because they've been blessed by my generosity. Are you kidding me right now? Can you imagine someone coming up to you and saying, thank you for caring for me? Can you imagine coming into eternity and someone saying, thank you for opening your home to me? Someone saying to you, thank you for providing a church for me. Can you imagine someone saying, you rearranged your life to move over and make room for me. Thank you for sending a missionary to my part of the world. Thank you for sending copies of the Bible in my language. Thank you for what you did because God used what you gave to change me. Can you imagine this? And, and God's not going to be like, hey, how was that extra large order of french fries you had at McDonald's? Good job. He's going to say, thank you for the sacrifice of skipping that big cheeseburger so that someone in another country can hear the message of Jesus Christ. This is what, what, what we're aiming at here, right? I want to I live well here so that when I die, you all weep. But when, I want to also live well so that when I die, there's going to be rejoicing when I go to heaven. You see, both things can be true. Yeah, we're going to miss each other, but doggone it, there's a reward awaiting us that says they are going to welcome you into eternal dw dwellings because of your generosity. Wow. 
So ladies and gentlemen, money is to be a temporal vehicle to bring about eternal good. What we have is to be used to further God's purposes and to bless God's people. Don't miss this, you guys. See, notice in verse, verse, um, verse 8, notice what it says there, and I want you to circle this world, word. For the sons of this age, circle this age, people in this world have limited vision. You know how they live their lives? Between two poles, birth, death. And all the things that matter exist between those two poles of existence, birth and death. We as believers understand true life happens beyond that second pole of death. People say, you only live once, and I go, yeah, and then you live for eternity. YOLO, how does that work out? You only live once, and then you live for, oh, figure it out. <laughs> we are eternal creatures, and the only two things that will live forever is the word of God and the souls of men and women. That's it. No one's going to care about your career. No one's going to care what zip code you lived in. No one's going to care what kind of car you drive. What's going to matter is when you stand before God, he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You invested in the things that will last forever. See, Jesus is, he, he, he's saying you're not the sons of this age. You're the sons of light. Light is illuminating. Life is seeing. Life, light is understanding, right? The people of this world think about how they're going to use their resources, and they use them, and they misuse them repeatedly. But the sons of light ought to be different. See, you may not be shrewd in the stock market. How many of you are like Dow Jones, NASDAQ? I don't understand any of this. I'm going to tell you right now, it's okay. What happened with GameStop and what is short selling? Blah, blah, blah. Some of you are like, I don't understand. Here's what I'm going to tell you. You don't have to understand. Who cares? Because if you invest in things of eternal value, you've got a billion years to enjoy your investment. They're going to lose their investment in 80 years. You've got a billion years. Who's the shrewd one now? See, our ultimate motive, honor God, number one. Your ultimate motive, living for righteousness, right? Using God's, his stuff for him, right? We're managers, we're not owners. You first honor God, second, you love others. That's how you spend money. It's generosity. See, the only thing this guy was generous with was, his, was with his master's money, and he did it selfishly. The only thing God wants you to be generous with is with his resources. And when you do it for him, nothing's wasted. Nothing's wasted. Luke 12, verse 33. Look at this verse. Sell your possessions, give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. Woohoo! Here's the key. Use earthly resources to not only benefit God's purposes, but bless God's people. People are eternal. And because this is true, my heart is to know, is to, is to prepare you for what's coming. And that is eternity. Are you ready to meet your God? And so I will use whatever affluence in order to influence. This is key. How are you leveraging your affluence to influence others? Because we're gonna we need to consider the fact that all of us are going to be equally welcome into heaven. All of us are going to be equally loved in heaven, but not all of us will have equal amount of friends in heaven. Isn't that cool? Like there's going to be some people and they're going to be like, why are those people swarming to that person? Because they invested in them. I was thinking about like when we started Sozo and Missio Day, and I know there's still some of you, we're in our 11th year doing this. There's some of you still that go, I don't know how this all works out. You're a coffee shop, you're a church, what, you know, make up your mind. No, I don't have to. We love Christ, we love coffee, that's all you need, right? But you know why we did this? We did not do, build this to build a business. We built this to build a community. 
I was thinking of the words of Francis Schaeffer. If you're not familiar with Francis Schaeffer, he had a community in Switzerland called La Brie Fellowship. And this is where college students can come and just talk about philosophy and ethics and religion and all that cool stuff. Schaeffer has a quote I love. It's a costly business to have a sense of community. It's a costly business. We have never made a profit here. Matter of fact, every year we are in the negative. And that's on us. We've invested m- tens of thousands of dollars into this. And you know what? I would gladly continue to not make money and lose money in order to have the influence and impact we're having on people that we meet every single day. Isn't that awesome? I'm, I'm thinking to myself, Lord, we are here and we're leveraging coffee as a means to connect with people at a deeper level. Here's your latte. Do you know about the Lord, right? It's not that simple. But I'll tell you, it's enriching every week that Lori and I have opportunities to tell people about hope and love and joy, especially in a world that's fragmented and discouraged and depressed, right? We need hope. So this is why we're doing what we're doing. And this is why this week, pray for us, we're going down the Rocky Point to build a home for a single older senior woman named Clara. Here she is. You can pray for her. Pray for our trip. We're taking down 25 people tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock to go build a house. There she is. There's Clara. She has a little side hustle where she sells clothes. Um, she lives in a little lean-to. I think there's barely a foundation, but we're going to build a little home for her this week, and we're going to build it from start to finish in two and a half days. So we're going to go this week. So here's the thing. You know what? We, we don't do this to build a home, we do this to build relationships. Because more than building a home for Clara is making sure she has an eternal home with Jesus. Do you understand 25 people giving up their spring break and actually paying to do this? You would think there's a company out there that says, we're hiring people, come down and build a house. No, no, no. We're all paying to go do this. I'm paying to sleep in a tent with my boys for, for three nights. Do you think that's, I'm looking forward to this? There are people that are going to be sleeping in an RV. There are going to be people who are taking showers in these bathhouses at this compound in, in Mexico. We're going to Rocky Point. We're not staying at Las Palomas. We are staying at a compound in the desert. Why? Because Clara and her community matter to Jesus. And we will gladly give whatever it takes for her to know the love of Christ. Whether we build a good A-frame uh, home or not, we hope, it does. we hope it's good. But here's what matters, is for her to one day even welcome those of you who were part of supporting people to go to Mexico. They say thank you. Wouldn't it be cool to see Clara in heaven and be like, you made it, thank you. Thanks for spending your spring break. Like we were thinking of like San Diego. No, we're taking our kids, we're gonna go serve. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what ministry is all about. Are you investing in people's lives? That's the most important thing. Honor God by investing in the lives of people. Point number two. And we're going to go through these next ones real quick. Use worldly wealth to demonstrate faithfulness. So all that stuff, that's my intro. Everything I've already set up to this point is my intro. Here's the thing. So you're going, I wish I had more. Here's the point. But you haven't been faithful with what you have. I mean, let's be honest. Some of you are, are terrible managers. And God's saying, you, you see yourself as a good investment. God's going, you're not a good investment. That guy over there, he's a good investment. You wonder why you don't have, well, God says to you, because you don't use what you have in a way that honors me and loves people. Does that, does that sound harsh? Because I can make it harsher. It ought to be harsh. Right? The reality of it is this. God wants us to be faithful with a little, and when he sees you faithful with a little, what does it say? He gives you more. If you can't handle worldly wealth, how are you going to handle true riches in heaven? Because one day we're going to stand with Christ, and the Bible says, Romans 8, you will be co-heirs of everything Jesus owns. Here's a question. What does Jesus own? Boom! Isn't that awesome? Like, you're being tested here so that God says, I'm going to entrust you. I'm going to give you, you're a manager here. You're going to be an owner one day. 
And everything that Jesus owns, you will also own as well based upon your faithfulness here. You want to know why faithfulness is important? That. Are you a good investment? Does God consider you faithful with what he's already entrusted to you? Possessions are a responsibility. This is not a matter of ability. This is a matter of character. You have to see this, that the use of of what you have been entrusted is a test of character. It's a test of values. It's a test of your management skills. There are companies out there that won't hire you unless they see a credit report. Think about that. You can't get a job at a company. You want to know why? Because if they're sitting there going, if your financial house is in disorder, why are we going to entrust you with a position in our multi-billion dollar company? Can I tell you, I've, in ministry, I've had men and women step down from leadership because they haven't honored God with their finances. Now you're saying, how do you know these things? Because I ask my admin people. I say, how are, how are my leaders doing? And there could be a person that says, this person doesn't give. And that's the moment I have, I have a sit down, come to Jesus meeting with that leader and say, you're serving in a church where we preach generosity and you don't exhibit this? I expect people to do the same with me. As a matter of fact, anytime you want to sit down and look at bank accounts, let's do it. I'm, there, I have nothing to hide. My wife, my family, we give. And we try to give generously and we try to increase that. As God increases our standard of living, he'll, we get to increase our standard of giving. We want you to do the same. We are not going to preach a message that we are not a living ourselves. Because when I'm faithful in the things that are unseen, I have no problem one day realizing what may, will be disclosed, not just to people, but ultimately to God. We act as if God doesn't see, Right? what our hearts are attached to. Ladies and gentlemen, finances are important because money reveals the heartbeat of your integrity. It reveals the things that we truly love. So do you use your finances in a faithful way that proves that God is your supreme treasure? That's so important. So faithfulness. Number three, we are to use, see how quickly we're going now? We're to use worldly wealth to demonstrate Worship, meaning you're going to continually on a day-to-day basis prove to the world, prove to God what you worship. Do you worship money or do you worship God? Because it can't be both. Here's what I want you to write down something very, very interesting here. Money is relational currency. See, we think of money as a means to buy material goods. Can I tell you right now, biblically, money is relational currency. When you look at that dollar, boy, I just happen to have 20, 40, 60, 80, 85 bucks. Someone's going to a bougie lunch today. Yeah. I need to see this. So Ramsey says what? Every dollar has a name. Every dollar has an assignment. I'm going to tell you every dollar has a relational connection. Money is relationship. How can $5 not only reveal that I love God more than I love this $5, but how can this $5 be relational in the sense that who can I spend it on versus myself? Enough for me, more for others. How about $25? How about $45? Carry this. Yeah, that's correct. $65. I went to public school. Ladies and gentlemen, you cannot, Jesus says you do not have the ability to worship God and money. And the reason he says these two things are important is because they're so closely connected in what they provide. Money gives the illusion that it provides security, it provides contentment, it provides longevity. But here's the one thing money can't provide that God does provide, that's relationship. Money does not care if you're depressed. Money does not care if you're, if you're discouraged. Money does not care if you're angry. Because you know what money will do? It will go find somebody else. It is a lousy God. Money is a lousy God. 
You know, when you hear that phrase, oh, he died a millionaire, she died a millionaire. No, they didn't. They died. (laughs) You don't take anything with you. And so God requires this single-hearted devotion to him here because he says, money's a great servant, but it's a horrible God. Think about this. Money is to be used, not loved. If I live for money, it becomes my master. If I give my money, it becomes my servant. Which are you going to choose? And I came up with this. You know, there's some organisms once in a while. We need to love God and leverage money because if not, you'll become a person that leverages God and loves money. I remember driving the president of Michigan State University years ago when I worked at the Ritz-Carlton. Poor college student eating Hunan's back door. Remember, newly engaged with my wife. So I was living at the Ritz-Carlton, driving limo. Drove Ted Nugent, drove Van Halen, drove Michael Hudgens from NXS. Lots of famous Tom Cruise when they're filming Days of Thunder. I'm driving the president of, of Michigan State University to the airport. We're having a little conversation. He finds out I want to go to the ministry. He says, oh, wow, there's gold in them their hills. I said, you don't understand ministry, do you? But in his mind, he's thinking, you know, oh, you want to become a minister? I see TBN. I see all the health, wealth, prosperity preachers, right? Like there's, there's money in, and it's like, no, 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 no. Listen to me. I am not going into this to leverage God in order to love money. I'm going into this to tell people that Jesus is the way and God wants a relationship with you. No more talking in the car. <laughs> Have a good day. Right? Are you seeing, are you, I got a good tip. I did. Um, do you, do you understand that you ought to singularly, single-heartedly love God more than you love anything else? It almost looks like, you know, your worship, that you love God so much that you hate resources. You hate money. Do you display a life that says, I don't need it? That's what God wants. Because when you have the treasure Earthly treasure doesn't compete with your affections. When you have the treasure, nothing else is sparkly. Nothing else is shiny. Nothing, other, nothing else is like, oh, there's a reason why car showrooms are so, so clean. Right? They give this appearance like, oh my goodness, we were just in Las Vegas, same thing. Like at night, Las Vegas looks amazing. At, during the day, it's a, it's a scum. It's scumville. It's a scum. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but okay. <laughs> it's dirty. It's sad. Right? Sons of light don't live in the dark. We, we live in the light where things are exposed. Look at verse 9. What you worship reveals what you value. Right? You look at your schedule, you look at your bank account, you're going to see what you value. You can tell me all you want. I love God, I love God. But if your schedule and your bank account don't show that, you don't love God. You, you don't. Notice verse 9. This is why this is important. Look what he says, the phrase, circle it, when it fails. Don't miss this. Jesus doesn't say, you know, if it, fa-. no, no, no. Jesus is certain. It's going to fail you. Money will fail you. So that's why we are to use it for eternal spiritual purposes. Everything in this world ultimately does. Everything breaks, everything dies, everything rebels against us. So if we put our things, our hope in the things here below, we're going to be disappointed. It's not a matter of, 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 of if, it's a matter of when. Luke 12, look back at this passage. This is so good, right? Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Notice, God has already promised something that will blow your mind and make blood shoot out of your eyes, and here it is. You are promised the kingdom. So in light of that, sell your possessions, give to the needy, provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. Have we lost sight of the fact that your father's going to give you the kingdom? Did we mention this? So in light of that, (laughs) I don't need this stuff. Amen? Sell. Give. Sell. Give. Rinse, repeat, sell, give. Your Father is going to give you the kingdom. 
What value is that to you? Last point, and we're going to just skirt over this real quick. Then he says in verse 14, the, the, the Pharisees were there and they're lovers of money. So guess what they do? They scoff at this teaching. And I'm sure there's some scoffers here today. That's cool. You're sitting there going, yeah, it, it was, it's good, but it's not important. But here's the thing. Jesus then says in verse 14, 15, 16, 17, he talks about John the Baptist. He talks about uh, marriage. Here's what Jesus is getting at. The true heart is an obedient heart that doesn't consider the things of God too strict. See, the Pharisees thought Jesus was too liberal when it comes to his love for sinners and tax collectors, but now when it comes to his teaching on money, he's too strict. What is it? Is he too liberal? Is he too strict? Here's the problem, right? You're too liberal when it comes to the things you feel strong conviction about, and you're too strict of the things you want to kind of justify. And then Jesus calls him to the ultimate thing. He says, you want to call, you want to call me liberal? How about your liberal policy when it comes to marriage? You guys are divorcing anyone you want for whatever reason you want. The new era has come. There is a righteousness that cannot be earned. It is about me. Enter the kingdom. You like how I just took 14 through 18 and just said, there it is. None of this matters if you haven't entered the kingdom of God by way of the door, Jesus. When there's a heart of obedience that says, I will, I will honor God no matter how strict it may sound, no matter how tough it may be, I will enter the kingdom and be obedient to him because I believe he knows what's best for me. And whether it be how I spend the money that's entrusted to me as a manager or how I love my life when things get rough and I said, I don't want to divorce you, what matters is a heart that is obedient to God that says, I will fight for what God is honored by. Here's what I'm grateful for, church. A God who comes to us and says, I want to settle your debt. And I don't want you to settle half, half price. He says to us, I'm going to take your debt, I'm going to pay it in full. Do you want that deal? And so God settles the debt with us through Jesus Christ. See, back to communion, back to the cross, right? None of this matters if you don't have a relationship with God who paid the cost himself by giving himself. 2 Corinthians says, God made him who was rich to become poor for us so that through his poverty you and I might be made rich. Bank accounts and reputations and daily schedules don't mean anything if your heart hasn't been won by God who says, I have paid your debt and I've done it by giving you me and if you now live in me, you'll understand the value of now giving yourself so that others might have their debts forgiven as well. Because there's eternity coming and to hear God say, well done, good faithful servant, that's going to be a reward, but also seeing those lives that were impacted by your generosity, can't wait. And all God's people said, Love you guys. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thanks for this morning and, and uh, an, an important teaching on generosity. And I pray that it would become so much more than just something that's in our minds, but it would infiltrate our hearts. Uh, you know how wayward our hearts get. You know how tricky our hearts can be. You know how we can self-justify certain behaviors. And Lord, you have for some reason chosen the topic of money and finances as the litmus test of how we love you. you you've chosen the topic of money as that of, that, of that thermostat to show us where we're at with you. Lord, if we've become too attached to, to wealth and possessions and money, may the strength of Christ free us from that. May we see money as a lousy God. And may we understand you as the supreme treasure and that in light of you as our treasure, everything is worth sacrificing for the sake of having you and knowing you. Lord, lead us in this place of, 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 of generosity that says we value Christ more than anything and we value the lives of others more than anyone else. 
Help us to live for these eternally significant purposes. Because that's what you've done for us in the, in the personal work of Jesus Christ. You've redeemed us so that we as eternal creatures can spend eternity with you. That is an awesome gift. That is an incredible price that you've paid. Thank you for loving us that way. You are worthy to be worshipped. You are worthy to be adored. You are worthy to be treasured above all things. So thank you for allowing us to to, to know you and be a part of your family, God. Help us to live lives that honor you. Let us point people to Jesus. Let's live for eternal things. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great day. You guys, we'll see you soon.